Good morning, everyone. Well done for making in for nine o'clock. Um, before I start, fair warning, this is a new talk. And you shouldn't really give new talks in conferences, but it's just the way this panned out. Uh, Mark's in the room next door. He's a lot funnier than I am, and he also juggles. So if you want to leave and go to that one, I'm not going to be offended. Well, David here has said he's going to juggle if, if things get really bad. So, so my name's Shahid. Uh, I'm a freelance hands-on consultant working in .NET, uh, Azure, and more recently Kubernetes. I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I'm based in the UK, although I work globally. I had the pleasure of being based in Sydney a couple of years ago for about three months. I absolutely love this city, so it's a real honor to be able to come back and speak. I also co-organize a meetup in the UK, and I'm really passionate about getting people to start speaking. So it's something, if there's something you're interested in, come and speak to me afterwards. I can try and give you some advice. The main reason for this slide really is my contact details. So if we don't get a chance to get to questions today, uh, I'll be around all day, be around this evening as well. But get in touch with me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, I'm reasonably active on Twitter, usually. So in terms of the agenda, what we're going to talk about today is really, so you decide to move to microservices. Um, you introduce some new challenges when you do that. And often people don't quite appreciate these new challenges. There's a tendency to latch on to the shiny new things and start adopting without realizing. Now, of course, none of you do this. It's other people, but just wanted to make sure we cover that off. And we'll talk about how we can use some of the, some of the shiny new things to help address the problems. So the key thing here is we have the problem, then we address it with the technology. We don't apply the technology, then try and you know, fit our application into that. Hopefully, there'll be some demos, although one of them may be a video because it's not working this morning. So what I'm not going to cover today, I'm not going to talk about how we decompose a monolith into microservices. Um, frankly, that's a huge topic. It's one I could probably start ranting a lot about. And you don't want to hear me rant too much. Uh, we're not going to deep dive into how we create containers. And we're not going to deep dive into Kubernetes. Um, how many people here were at the talk yesterday, Kubernetes talk yesterday? OK, quite a fair few of you. And how many were at the uh, service mesh talk later on in the? OK. I've got a feeling we may have some overlap with the service mesh talk. So again, apologies for that. It's just the way it's panned out. So how many people here are working on microservices architectures? Wow, that's quite a lot. And using uh, containers and um, yeah, in production, the nodding heads, Kubernetes, Istio. OK, good. So not too many Istio people. That's good, because otherwise, this really isn't a talk for you. How many people don't know anything about Kubernetes or Docker or anything? I just want to make sure that I, I, I level set with the audience. Awesome. OK. That's enough. You don't need to do any more work now. So microservices. I'm not going to talk through this slide. I'm sure most of you are bored to death of people talking about it. Just going to highlight a couple of things. Modular services aligned to business capabilities and independently deployable. And that last bit's really important. It's the bit that often goes wrong. And if you, do, if you get it wrong, then essentially what you've done is you've created a distributed monolith. You've taken what was previously an in-memory function call, turned it into a network call, and added a crap ton of latency to that. So and the other thing that's not on this definition, which I often hear people talk about, is the size. People say it should be x number of lines of code. It should be you know x be able to rewrite it in two weeks and all of this stuff. For me, that's the least important aspect of a microservice. If you're getting stuck on the size of it, go big. If you're not sure, go big. It's much, much easier to deal with a couple of big microservices, which you can then break down into smaller ones, then start with 100 microservices and then try and figure out what the hell you're doing. So that's, that's about all I want to say on that topic. So why do, we, why do people go down this route? Well, there's a number of benefits. We have the ability to independently scale our services. So rather than having to scale up the whole, uh, the whole monolith, we can scale up independent services which are receiving the most load. Um, from a code point of view, we can deploy smaller, less risky code changes because we're not deploying code that hasn't changed. And we have a lower cognitive load for development teams. This is a bit that's often missed. If you're working on a large system, trying to keep all of that in your head as you're working on it is quite tricky. With the microservices, you're able to scope your thinking down to the, the scope of the microservice. So it actually makes it a lot easier. And then finally, you can also distribute work amongst teams. 
So you're not having to share uh, too many libraries, things like that. You're working independently. The one that often is also mentioned is you can write in any language you want. Again, this is one of these things where just because you can write in any language you want doesn't mean you should. Most of you who work in any kind of enterprise environment know there's a lot of governance issues around this. But again, it's worth mentioning. So we've got our monolith here. And you know, I'm proud to say it's a well-structured monolith. It's, it's uh, nicely um, split into modules. And we want to turn it into microservices. So of course, what we do is we've got a bank, and we turn it into microservices, um, except oh, everyone knows when you talk about microservices, they have to be hexagons. So let's get that right from the start. I think it's called Sam's Law. Um, Sam Neiman's not in the audience, so I can safely say that. Um, of course, you don't do this. This is not how it works. You typically go back to your monolith, and you start splitting it out. So you take one of your components, and you turn it into a microservice. But of course, the microservice doesn't sit and live in existence. It has to be connected somewhere. So the monolith is deployed on a server somewhere. Let's say this is a kind of .NET framework application. You're running it on a VM somewhere. Now you've essentially got two applications. You need to run that microservice on another machine, another VM somewhere maybe. And of course, they need to talk to each other. So we've gone from a single deployment, a single application now to essentially two deployments, two applications, and some networking things to do. We carry on the evolution. Of course, no surprise. We've now split out another one of our uh, modules into a microservice. We've now got three servers, three deployments, you can see where this is going. So let's take it to the kind of natural conclusion on this particular side. So we've got four, we've got four services here, uh, four deployments, four sets of networking. So essentially, we've gone four times more complicated than we were before. Then we have the pesky users. If it wasn't for the users, my applications would be so much better. Um, so they need to access things. So we've got a front end, and the front end needs to access some of the back ends. So now we're punching holes in our firewalls in order to in, in a, allow internet traffic to access it. Things have got a lot more complicated. So we went from that one deployment to now four deployments, four times as many, well, it worked on my machine. So what are the kind of problems we've just created by moving to microservices? Well, we've added a lot more complexity to our deployments and environments. Imagine those four servers and four sets of networking rules times three environments, you know, dev, QA, and prod got many more points of failure and added latency. How, how do we debug applications now? Previously, it was just a single process. Now we're having to call other services. Debugging's definitely got a lot harder as well. Network and traffic routing. I'm from the UK. We say routing. I know that means something different over here, so try not to snigger. Um, routing. Again, that's got a lot trickier. Previously, it was just a single application. How about tracing? Now our requests come in, and they actually hit multiple services. How do we know where, where's the traffic flowing, how long it's taking to reach individual um, underlying services? And finally, there's a bit of a security concern now. We've got a lot more components, a, a, a bigger surface area. So we've gone from a simple deployment to a lot more complicated things. It's, you know, this, these are the things you don't often think about when you move to microservices. So what can we do? to try and tackle some of these problems. And let's look at the first point. Um, so maybe this is somewhere where containers can come to the rescue. So for those of you who don't know what containers are, very briefly, essentially they're a package encapsulating your application and its dependencies. So from your CI system, you would be building containers and not binaries anymore. The key thing is they provide isolation and consistent behavior across environments. So if it works in one environment, it should work in the other environment. They're very, I mean, think of them as lightweight VMs. They're very quick to start up, and they give you that kind of isolation. Maybe not as strong as VMs do, but, it, but not, not too far away. And they're portable. So essentially, anywhere that can run a container should be able to run your container. So now our VMs, which previously had a lot of uh, frameworks installed, had a lot of dependencies on them, can now be vanilla VMs as long as they've got a runtime on them. So I've got my containers. Now, how do I manage them? Well, of course, because now I've got isolation, I can pack my kind of containers onto multiple machines, and I, I, I don't need as many machines anymore, so that's better. What if one of these machines dies? Um, I'm going to have to know that machines died, but hopefully everyone's got kind of the appropriate alerting and, and things set up. 
you have to go and figure out what's running on those machines and you have to run them somewhere else. So maybe this is where container orchestrators can help. So there's actually quite a lot of them, but I'm gonna talk specifically about Kubernetes because it's almost become the de facto container orchestrator. So again, very briefly, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. It was originally created by Google, but it's now owned by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, it's open source, it's on GitHub, and you can have a look at it. So what does it do? So essentially, we take a bunch of machines, we deploy our container orchestrator Kubernetes across them, and now as a developer, I don't care about the underlying machines anymore. All I do is I deploy my containers, and I let the platform take care of managing them. So if at two o'clock in the morning, one of those servers dies, it's not my problem. Kubernetes will detect that container was running and it will move it, or basically find somewhere else to run them. So along with container orchestration, Kubernetes gives you a couple of other things. So it lets you manage your configuration and your secrets in a more consistent manner. It has the capability of have, having self-healing applications. We can auto scale our applications and our cluster and it gives us some really nice capabilities around service discovery. So when we auto scale our applications, we can load balance our traffic across them. And it has some, some basic ingress control. So essentially we can control or, or route our traffic coming into our cluster in a, in a quite basic way, but it's there, it's better than nothing. And actually has many more features, but I won't spend too long on them. Now you're probably thinking, well, Kubernetes is quite a big thing and you're suggesting that to solve our complexity, we use Kubernetes. Doesn't sound like a very sensible option. And I would say, yeah, broadly speaking, you're probably right. If you want, if you're going to run your own Kubernetes cluster, that's a big undertaking. You have to, you have to appreciate the complexities involved in that. This is where these managed Kubernetes providers can really help. So as many, many tech companies offer these, uh, I've only called out the main cloud providers. But essentially, the managed Kubernetes providers reduce the operational complexity of Kubernetes quite a lot. So you still need to have some knowledge of Kubernetes, but you're not having to deal with the backing up at CD and making sure it's highly available and all of these complex tasks. So I would argue, actually, you do reduce the overall complexity if you go down this route. So let's come back to our kind of problem checklist and see how we're doing. So with the aid of containers and that isolation and consistency and Kubernetes, we've hopefully dealt with that infrastructure and complexity problem. Kubernetes has some self-healing capabilities. Hopefully we've dealt with the multiple points of failure. Debugging, no, I don't think we've done anything about debugging just yet. Network and traffic routing, um, again, I think Kubernetes has some support for this, but um, it's, it's pretty basic. Tracing and logging, again, don't think we've done much with this just yet. And finally, again, with security, we've got a consistent deployment platform. So we've, we don't need to configure individual machines anymore, but you know, I think we can do better, especially if you imagine an environment where you've got hundreds of microservices. How do you know what services talk to which other service and what's going on in your cluster? So let's talk about debugging. Uh, maybe this is somewhere where developer tooling can help. And again, this is one area where there's a huge amount of innovation. And to be honest, there's probably two talks alone in just the tools. I want to focus on one aspect in particular. So when you look at the typical flow when you're coding for Kubernetes, you write your code, it's pretty standard. You check your code into a repository because everyone's using repositories now. This isn't 2000. You push, the, the repository builds a container, which pushes to a container registry. You create or update some kind of deployment package. So this will be things like Helm. And then you deploy that package to Kubernetes. So we're doing local development, and then we've got continuous inter integration, and then deployment continuous or otherwise. But as a developer, that's quite a long cycle. I'm only doing the local dev. How do I debug my code? How do I check my code in a real environment? And the problem gets more complicated with microservices because what if my service depends on other services? So I've got service A here, and it get, gets called by a front end, and it calls another service. How do I work with service A in a in the correct way. A couple of options, or a few options. What I could do is I could mock out those dependent services. Um, it's not a bad option, but it adds a bit of complexity because now I'm mocking things in dev and then I have to change that for the other environments. 
what I could do is I could run all the dependent services on my local machine. So I could run something like Minikube, Docker for Windows, and I could spin up all the dependent services and work with my service. And again, that's not a bad option. A couple of problems with this. It makes my developer machine slightly more complicated, so it makes onboarding a new developer slightly more complicated, and also means I need a lot more resources on my machine. This is a simple example with three services. Imagine if you had tens of services. Um, now, of course, as developers, it may be a handy excuse to get nice, beefy machines, but it's not necessarily scalable in, in a big, big enterprise. Another option is to run everything in a remote cluster. I could have a dev cluster somewhere, run everything in that dev cluster. But how do I debug? Um, do I need to write trace statements and then deploy my container and then kind of view them? It's not necessarily a great experience. So the final option is what if I run my dependent services in a remote cluster, but I run the service I'm working on on my local machine. And this is an area where things like telepresence and Azure Dev Spaces tries to help. So Azure Dev Spaces has this concept of workspaces. And in my workspace, I can deploy my application as it is currently. And it gets a front end domain name, which I can call. And the traffic it just routes through as you'd expect. Now I want to work on service A and I want to work on the next version of service A. What I can do is on my local machine, I can start developing service A v2. When I create my own dev space in AK, uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, dev spaces, what it does is it gives me a new domain name, a, a new front end domain name. When I hit that domain name, traffic is actually routed to the existing front end, down to my laptop, allows me to debug on my laptop and then it routes back up to the routes back up to the cluster for any other dependent services. So this way, I'm actually able to work on service A on my local machine. I don't need to have Minikube or Kubernetes on my local machine. And I'm not having to deploy all the other services. So I think it's pretty cool. The nice thing is you can also share that space. So you can, that space is essentially pushed up into AKS. And somebody else can come and use that. So they can come and hit that front end and they'll get the same experience. Your laptop doesn't have to be running the whole time for that to work. These dev spaces in, essentially inherit from each other. So in this case, my dev space inherited from the default space, and then I essentially I overrode service A. You can create entirely new blanks dev space and, and replace any of the components if you want. But I think it's quite an interesting approach to solving that particular problem. Speaking of dev spaces, it's in public preview. I'm setting up the excuses for when the demo goes wrong. Um, it works in Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio. Um, some of you may remember it when it used to be called Visual Studio Connected Environment, such a catchy name. Um, it has first class support for uh, .NET Core, Node.js, and Java. But actually you can run, uh, as long as you've got the Docker file, you can run other services as well. Um, and you can actually just use it just to debug containers and debug across containers. But this particular kind of uh, space concept is quite, quite cool, I think. So let's take a look at a demo. And I was going to do this live demo, but um, it's not working this morning. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flick to a little video I recorded. And yeah, we're sharing this good. So I'll quickly set this up before I go. So essentially what I've got here is I've got a VS Code and I've got a bog standard ASP, um, ASP.NET Core MVC application. And I'm in the home controller and this is the details um, action. And it's making a, a service call to the back end service here. There's this weird header thing. That's something that's necessary to allow the routing to work properly. But otherwise it's a bog standard service, just doing a back end service call and it's just going to write the uh, results to the view data message. I'm just going to run the video on. I just realized I highlighted the same things again. Let's just. So now what I've got is I've deployed my, uh, I'm just going to pause this so I can zoom in. So I've got my, um, the default names ready, namespace ready deployed, uh, workspace rather. If I zoom in, I'll just show you that. So it shows up that there's front end. You can see that there. Uh, if I remember to do this. I'll run the video on. And then on this side, what I've got is the back end service. So it's just, again, it's a SPNet Core Web API. 
and all it's going to do is return uh, a string. So this is now the V2 version I'm working on. You can see on this one, I'll run the video on, this is using the front end as a V1 and a back end of V1. This is the deployed default space. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the debugger. Get the video on a bit. I'm going to start the debugger on my uh, back end service. That usually takes a second or two to spin up. There we are, the debugger's now going. I've got a breakpoint on that get method. And now I change the front end, and again, I'll zoom in a bit on this. You can see now I've put my space name dot s. I don't know why it's a dot s. Let me just jump that back, because I think we missed the breakpoint being hit. So you see it hits the breakpoint, so I can now debug it if I wanted to, carry on through, and now you can see I'm getting the V2 backend, but the V1 front end. Now, even if I stop the debugger, I can then refresh that page and it still works. So there's no dependency on my machine being, you know, being available the whole time. I can share that space with somebody else. So it's just a quick intro to dev spaces. And let's get out of here and continue with the slides. So let's come back to our checklist. Uh, so we talked about the uh, infrastructure and the failure points already. Debugging, I should think now we've got, a, we've got some, some experience of debugging, so that's great. What about this network routing? Again, I don't think we've done anything beyond what Kubernetes gives us out of the box. Tracing and logging, again, don't think we've really dealt with this at all. And security concern, again, what we had before, we haven't really moved that on. So what can we do about these networking kind of service-to-service -service communication issues? And this is where things like a service mesh come to the rescue. Again, the most well-known service mesh is, sorry, actually service mesh is essentially infrastructure which um, handles service-to-service -service communications. So essentially it deals with the networking aspects of sending traffic to and from services um, and allows you to push this out of your network, uh, sorry, out of your application layer. Istio is the most well-known of service meshes, I think. It's an open source project being led by Lyft, IBM, and Google. It runs on top of Kubernetes um, and actually other providers as well, and it extends its capabilities. This is one of the awesome things about Kubernetes is you can de deploy things to Kubernetes which extend Kubernetes behavior. So it gives you this platform where you can then build other applications on top of. Many people think Kubernetes will become so ubiquitous that you won't even see it anymore. It'll become a layer below anything we, we're concerned about. And this is how these things happen. So Istio gives us a number of features. Gives us network, and network error handling. So this is things like retry logic, um, circuit breaking, timeouts. Now, of course, I'm presuming most of you here are kind of .NET people, and you're thinking, well, why would we want to do this? We can, we've got Poly in ASP.NET Core 2.1. We've got Poly built into the framework now, and that's a perfectly valid thing. Um, the reason you may want to use this kind of approach is because that circuit breaking and retry logic is in your code, and if all of your services are using the same language, then that's probably okay. But often in a big enterprise, you're going to have different languages being used, which means you have to re-implement that logic in every language that you're using. Now, there's obviously libraries out there for all of these, but you're doing something slightly different in each one. So this is where the ability to push this kind of concerns down out of your code into the platform, I think is quite powerful. Now, your code still needs to be able to deal with what the results of this platform gives you back, so the error codes, et cetera, but it just means you're not having to run libraries. The other benefit is, if there's a bug in the library, you have to redeploy your application. In this situation, you don't need to redeploy your application. So Istio allows you to apply rate limiting to your services. So if you've got a service, a badly behaved service in your cluster, you can apply rate limiting so it doesn't bring down the quality of service for other consumers as well. Allows you to do traffic shifting. Now we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, but essentially allows you to control where the traffic flows and how much of the traffic flows there allows you to inject faults into your services. Um, this is quite powerful because 
when you're working with multiple services, there's the likelihood of some kind of network failure is actually significantly increased. And being able to predictably inject faults into that um, mechanism and being able to test your applications is really quite powerful. And service-to-service -service communications, uh, Istio can secure them and apply policies. And again, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a second. And then finally, it allows you to trace the requests across service-to-service -service calls. So take a quick look at the architecture. I'm not going to spend too long on this. Um, essentially, Istio's architecture is comprised of two planes, if you like. You have what's called the data plane and the management plane. So the data plane is actually where your services live. So if I can get my clicker to work. So here's my service. And what Istio does is it, it injects a proxy alongside my service as a sidecar container into the pod. And this proxy intercepts all the traffic that's coming and going from my service. And then you can use that to apply policies, uh, encryption, and various other things. Now, you're probably thinking, well, if all my traffic is going through some kind of proxy, surely that's going to add a ton of latency. That's a valid concern. So Istio uses Envoy Proxy, and it's a C++ proxy specifically designed for this purpose. So it's quite lightweight. And um, a re recent podcast, they were saying it adds less than one millisecond latency to the, uh, to the traffic. So it's pretty high performing. Uh, Lyft use it in their infrastructure, and they run, I think the official term is a crap ton of services. Um, so clearly, they're quite happy with it. And I guess the benefits it gives you means it's worth that slight overhead. If you're in a super, super latency sensitive uh, application, then you're probably not using Kubernetes anyway. The management plane essentially is where all the configuration uh, and policies are defined for Istio. So this is the thing where the operator would actually set up the data. If you're wondering how you install Istio, this is, again is a really nice thing with Kubernetes. You can install Istio into Kubernetes just using Helm. So Istio uses an, a number of custom resource definitions, CRDs. This is one of the main mechanisms of extending Kubernetes. Um, as you spend more time in Kubernetes, you'll see how powerful CRDs are. And again, this will be one of the mechanisms where Kubernetes becomes almost ubiquitous and we work at a higher level. From an application point of view, that proxy is actually injected or can be injected completely transparently to our applications. So really nice thing is our applications don't need to be aware of Istio. They don't need to be modified in any way. When we deploy them, Istio will transparently inject that proxy into our service. Some people don't like that magic you can actually use the Istio command line tool to modify the manifest files. Again, I'll reiterate, it's the manifest files we're modifying. We're not modifying our container. We're not modifying our code. So let's talk about that service-to-service -service communications. So I've got this um, application, and we'll use this as a scenario for most of the rest of these uh, um, scenarios, rather. And um, what if a bad actor gets into my kind of network? Um, so there's Troy Hunt. I'm in Australia, it's kind of mandatory, really. And uh, he's snooping on the traffic. So what, what we can do with Istio is we can apply what's called mutual TLS. So we can ensure that the traffic between those services is encrypted with TLS. And this minimizes the chance of a man in the middle attack and prevents that, um, that particular attack. Now, Troy is very persistent. So what if he manages to compromise one of my services? And what he can do now is he can uh, use my service and actually contact one of the other services he shouldn't be contacting. Again, Istio allows you to define policies which say this service can only talk to this service and nothing else. So you can really lock down that particular communication. So in this case, the Istio policies will prevent um, that service from talking to anything else it shouldn't be talking to. So a couple of really useful powers there. So I talked about traffic shifting earlier. So essentially what traffic shifting does, it says, well, when I deploy, um, for example, I deploy a new version of my application. I've got the V2. What I want to do is I want to test this. We all know the best testing happens in production. So if I deploy my application, and what I want to do is I want to say, for a specific user, you know, there's one of my testers, Jason. When Jason logs in, I want Jason to see V2 of the application. But I want everyone else to see V1. So when Jason logs in, he actually gets to see V2. All the other users don't. And let's say Jason's tested this, he's happy, we, we can start rolling out. What we would commonly do is we would do a canary deployment. So what we do is we pick, um, get my animations right, there we are. Um, 
So we do a canary deployment. So now we've got this V2 deployed, what we can do is we can start sending some of the traffic to that V2. So let's send 10% of our traffic to the V2 service and let's monitor the telemetry from it and let's see how it behaves. And if we're happy with that, we can then roll it out to everybody. So that's essentially what traffic shifting does. Because of that proxy sitting there intercepting all the traffic, uh, we can collect metrics. Um, the metrics in Istio are collected in Prometheus, and it gives you some built-in dashboards which allow you to see, uh, so it uses Grafana to display these dashboards as well. Of course, you're free to use whatever dashboarding tool you want, if you want, uh, on top. And then it uses Jaeger to do distributed tracing, so you can view the traces of your service calls. So we'll have a look at these hopefully in a demo. So just to set the demo up, uh, so I'm using the book, book info demo. If you've looked at the Istio uh, webpage, I wanted to use the same, a very similar scenario so that when you go to those documentation, you can see a uh, similar scenario. So what we've got is uh, we, we've got two versions of our product review. And the first version doesn't display any stars, and the second version does display some stars. And what we'll do is we'll work, walk through some demos now, and we'll see some of that traffic shifting in action. So I'm running this on uh, Docker for Windows, Kubernetes on my local machine. And I've already installed Istio. So we look at the deployments for the Istio namespace. We see there's quite a lot of things. And again, this can look a little bit daunting at first, but it, it's stuff you don't necessarily need to care about. The nice thing with Istio is actually allows you to slowly um, use the features that you want. You don't have to go all in. You start adding in features at a later point. So if I have a look at my application, uh, incidentally, I've got kubectl alias to k on my machine. If you're wondering, um, it's just easier, and we don't have to argue about how we pronounce kubectl. Um, so if I get deployments from the uh, default namespace, you can see I've got details v1, product v1, ratings v1, and reviews v1. And that's the one we're going to deploy another version of. So let me go and deploy. Um, V2 of the reviews. And then I'll show you the page. Actually, let me show you the uh, app now. So this is the app. It's, uh, it's kind of like a book bookstore. And it's got the product details here. And then it's got the reviews. And you see there's no stars on the reviews. Let me just refresh this. Make sure it's all working. So what I'll do now is I'll deploy V2. Just check those are up. You see, it's just starting, so I'll give that a second. Obviously, everyone's watching, so it's going to take longer. There we are. Whew. So, if I come back to my app now, I shouldn't see any difference. Um, because at the moment, that service is there, but there's no traffic being routed to it. So it doesn't matter who it is, even if I log in as Jason. And Jason's got a super secure password. Troy will be very happy with this. Um, you see, there's still no, no stars. So I'm just going to sign out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply a policy on the traffic. So let me bring up my policy. So hopefully everyone can see that at the back. So the virtual service is essentially the service I'm routing traffic to, routing traffic to. Um, so it's a review service. So what I'm saying here is for the HTTP traffic, match the headers where it's JSON, send them to V2. Essentially, everyone else here goes to V1. So when I apply that, that traffic shifting will start, um, start being applied. So let's do that. Now, if I come back to the application, so again, I'm not logged in at the moment. So if I refresh this, whew, there we are. So no difference. Now, if I log in as Jason, oops, try that again. Interesting. 
That wasn't supposed to happen. This is where the fallback videos may be useful. Let's switch to a video. Jump ahead. So there's that uh, tra traffic shifting rule I'm going to apply. Again, now there's no stars. As soon as I sign in as JSON, there we are. You see the stars. So only JSON is seeing these. The V2 of my application. If I sign out. Again, I don't see the stars. So what I can then do is I can apply a rule that says, well, I'm happy with that. Let's just roll it out to everybody. So what we'll do now is apply that rule, which essentially rolls out to everybody. I could obviously have done a canary deployment here, started shifting some of the traffic. Now if I come back, now if I refresh it, we should see the stars. It doesn't matter who it is, we're now seeing the stars. Even if I sign in as JSON, see the stars. Now, I don't have a demo for this, but you can really prank your colleagues by using the fault injection and then the headers. So when a certain colleague logs in, they always get some faults. So just a handy tip there. So I think I'm actually well ahead of time, so we probably get a chance for some questions. Oh, actually, sorry, I didn't show you the distributed tracing. Let's do that. And again, since it's misbehaving, should we try? Should we try it live? Well, let's try it live. What the hell? What's the worst that can happen? So I need to do is I need to. Um, so in in my uh, cluster, it's running. Um, the distributed tracing is running. The Grafana is running. I just need to expose it. So let's see if this works. If not, I've got backups. So essentially, I'm just port forwarding the Grafana dashboard. Then if I go to hopefully the Grafana dashboard and refresh, there we are. So you can see out of the box, we get some really, well, I think quite nice looking dashboards. So we can see the mesh dashboard. Uh, so we get an overall kind of view of our services that are running, uh, how many requests we're getting, clearly not a lot because the cluster wasn't working. Uh, and then we get some latency numbers as well. Because we're intercepting all the traffic, we know how many requests are coming into a service, how many requests are leaving, how long it's taking, a lot more power than, a lot more knowledge than we had just with standard Kubernetes. We can dive into individual service if we want, um, and we can have a look at that. We can see the calls. Uh, it's a huge amount of data in here. And all of this is coming from the Prometheus backend, so if you want to use your own dashboarding solution, you can do that. You can apply that on top as well. Um, to be honest, these are quite cool. Just put them up in a place where clients come and visit, and it makes you look super cool. Um, so in the same manner, what we can do is we can look at the distributed tracing. So let's see, although there may not be any traces in there, but let's have a look anyway. If not, I'll show the video. So again, with the distributed tracing, I need to forward the relevant ports. Um, so let's just grab this. Oops, not that one. That was my shame of the other service. So this is Jaeger. So Jaeger is essentially a UI for the distributed tracing. So Istio uses a lot of these Cloud Native Computing Foundation components behind the scenes. Uh, so Jaeger is one of these uh, open tracing, um, which you can use yourselves in your own applications if you want to enhance the tracing. So essentially it gives us a, a plot of all of the requests and how long they're taking. And then what we can do is we can kind of drill into these. So if I just drill into this particular one, what we can see is the overall request as it came in through the gateway. And we can see called the products page, that which called the details page, and the products page also called the reviews page, the review page called the ratings, sorry, the service rather, called the rating service. And we can see how those requests kind of stacked up. So it gives us a lot more information than we had out of the box. Um, now if you want to really enhance this, you would, you would add this tracing into your own application. So then you are tracing 
on a more business domain concepts rather than purely just service to service communications. It's something I'd highly encourage you to do because otherwise this stuff is useful just to understand what's happening at a service level, but you really want to trace it at your application level. What, what's, what's it mean for your domain? What's, what's your customer's experience from this, performing this business action all the way through? Okay, I think that was all the demos. Let's go back to the slides. So, time to wrap up, I think. So let's come back to our checklist. So we've dealt with the containers that gave us that kind of consistency and Kubernetes gives us, reduces some of the complexity of setting up all these VMs and networking. And it helps us with some resiliency with multiple points of failure. Things like uh, telepresence and dev spaces and actually many other tools as well allow us to debug our applications. And then now, as hopefully I've shown you, well, very briefly, uh, we can do network and traffic routing as well. And something I didn't talk about there is Istio can allow you to control um, edge traffic as well, so traffic coming in at the edge of your cluster, and quite nicely, you can also control traffic leaving your cluster, so you can actually prevent uh, services from talking to the internet, for example. And the other bit I didn't mention, and since I've got time, I can elaborate a bit, uh, Istio can actually expand into VMs as well. So you can run a cluster which has got some VMs on it as well, and Istio can actually expand the mesh across the VMs. And uh, at the moment, they're also working on multi-cluster, so expanding uh, mesh across clusters as well. So quite powerful concepts. Hopefully, I've just shown you the kind of tracing and logging capabilities, and hopefully I showed you that we can thwart Troy uh, using some of the uh, uh, encryption and policies. So the way these things should work, why you end up with things like Istio and Kubernetes is because you've got a monolith and you're really sure that splitting into microservices is the right thing for you. And actually, let me just, let me rant for a minute. Um, monoliths, it's become a bad word in our industry and it really isn't. Some of the best talks I went to this year were about people who moved back to a monolith. So if you're sitting there with a monolith thinking, oh, oh, the shame of us working in a monolith, honestly, do not be ashamed. Uh, the other thing is, a lot of people talk about these things. You come to a conference like this and you hear lots of shiny technology and you think, well, we're, we're miles behind everyone else. No, you're not. There are many companies running VB6 applications and COBOL applications, so honestly, don't feel like you're miles behind. Nothing wrong with a monolith. A well-designed monolith is much better than terribly designed microservices architecture. There was a great talk yesterday, again, from somebody talking about this. So let's say you're really, really sure, so you go down the microservices route. When you do that, then it kind of naturally leads you down the route of containers, and that leads you down the route of orchestration, and then things like service meshes. Service meshes are not necessarily essential. What I see often happens is people say, oh, containers are cool, orchestration is really cool, and so are service meshes, let's use them. We've got to break our monolith into some kind, something else to make it work, and then we start doing microservices, and they end up, usually end up doing it bad, so please don't do that. So, just to wrap up, cloud native technologies can help alleviate some of the complexities caused by microservices. It's worth mentioning, complexity is really removed. You know, it's like the first law of thermodynamics. Um, it's really removed, it's just converted into another form. And the nice thing is, hopefully it becomes somebody else's problem. So in the case of Kubernetes, you know, managing the VMs yourself, move to Kubernetes, and then move to a managed Kubernetes, it becomes somebody else's problem. So that's, that's cool. The developer tooling in particular is an area of rapid innovation and everything I've shown you today is probably already out of date. If somebody's watching the video, it's definitely out of date. And service meshes can really help with this service to service communications, but you really don't, you know, you don't need them. They're not a must. It's only if your particular use case needs them, then you should uh, decide to uh, adopt them. Because it's added complexity at the end of the day. So if you want to learn more, um, if you want to learn more about Kubernetes specifically, shameless plug, I did a talk at NDC Oslo. Um, so if you want to learn more about Kubernetes in the context of a .NET developer in particular, that video is on, um, on YouTube, uh, on the uh, NDC conferences channel. Istio is at that place. These two books are very, very good books. I'd highly recommend them. The uh, Distributed Systems book is actually, I think it's still available for free uh, registration where you're from um, Azure. And then the one in the middle is the one I really want to shout out. So Catacoda, how many people have heard of Catacoda or used it? Oh, not too bad. This is awesome. So this is a free online learning platform 
which allows you to go away and learn, get some hands-on kind of experience with cloud native technologies. It's completely free to use and all you need is a browser and an internet connection. So if you've got a corporate laptop that's locked down and you can't install Docker or Minikube or things like that, Catacode is awesome. Uh, there's some new content on there recently for Istio in particular. So if you want to learn more about Istio, I'd highly recommend those courses. They'll take you through a lot more than I showed you. They'll show you the faulty injection stuff. It'll show you uh, tracing with slow requests and many other things as well. Very, very cool site. Um, I don't work for Catacoda, um, but yeah, I, I love it so much. I always talk about it. And finally, that's all it is. So thank you. These slides are available at that uh, bit.ly link. Contact details are there. And then I think we've got time for some questions. Uh, I don't know the time. Has anyone got the time? Oh, awesome. OK. That's plenty of time. Any questions? If not, we can all go and get coffee. Uh, could you just wait? We we'll just get the mic so we can catch in. Thanks. Um, in the YAML that you were doing, the distribution of the traffic based on the header, uh, you were doing that just by V1, V2. Is there a tag that you're putting onto the service? Yeah, so the service has got a tag on it. Um, I, c I could show you all. I could, um. So just for people who weren't sure, they were, I think you're talking about this tag here? Yeah. So it actually refers to the version tag on there. Let me see if I can find the... Um, So actually refers to this label on the deployment. So I didn't show you the deployment um, YAML because it's pretty standard. Yeah, essentially it's using that. Any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering how the tracing oh, there you are. is actually <laughs> achieved. Is yeah. that all through the sidecar? Yes. Yeah, because all the traffic's going through the proxy uh, the proxy can basically then send the metrics and telemetry out as well. But as you can imagine, it's not aware of your business context of that particular service request. It's adding headers and it's tracing those headers through the service calls. Yeah, correlation ID exactly. But it, what it's not doing is it, it, you can't look at it and say, well, from adding an item to my cart to purchasing, you know, my cart takes, this is what it actually looks like in, in service calls. That's where you need to add your own um, own logging telemetry. So the uh, open tracing um, project has support for nearly all the languages you can think of. So you can just add that into your own code. When you want to integrate with other cloud services, uh, say like uh, in uh, DynamoDB or uh, table storage in Azure, how do you control your microservices accessing those services? Is there a specific user that each container runs as, each pod runs as? So at the moment, um, certainly, I don't know for the other cloud providers, there's a, uh, I think it's in an alpha project called Pod Identity on the Azure side, which essentially can assign an identity to a pod based on an Active Directory uh, user. But that's still a very kind of early days project. Um, so otherwise, I think it's going to be, at best, it'll be the service account or the service, the the permissions assigned to the actual service that's running. But yeah, I'm not sure there's, I'm not sure I know the perfect answer to that question, to be honest. Any more questions? Okay, in which case, thank you very much.